Hello, everyone. Well, looks like the chickens have come home to roost, and New York City now has more cases than France or South Korea. Hello, everyone. This is Chris Martinson. I'm here with your SARS-CoV-2 update, a.k.a. the honey badger virus, here on March 23rd, 2020. This is day 60 of my reporting. Why do I continue to do this? Because I keep getting awesome communications and emails from people saying that they've been helped by this. They've gone through a faster adjustment process. They were able to get prepared. And if I can just help one more person get prepared, I'm going to keep doing this. I'm going to start here with a quote from Epictetus. Very little is needed for everything to be upset and ruined. Only a slight lapse in judgment. That's all you need. And particularly when you're up against a foe like this one here, and we are facing an exponential increase in cases every second counts. It really matters. So, Let's go right to the numbers here. And um, yeah, China, 39. 38, 33, 39, those are the numbers. It must have some uh, CCP uh, order that says no more than 40. So this is completely unbelievable. And I don't have better data out of Italy. uh, Sorry, China at this point. Italy didn't get their numbers in yet, but total deaths, 5,476. Just a complete disaster unfolding over there as is uh, true in other countries as well. Total recovered is now standing at 7,000, um, and we still have serious critical at 3,000. So they are closing in on 0.1% uh, of their population and having been exposed at this point in time. So still a long way to go before herd immunity comes in. But the United States now clocking in with 7,000 new cases. Uh, this is mostly due to expanded testing. We knew that to be true. I'll talk to you about New York uh, here. And well, let's go right to it. New York cases surged 38% overnight. Uh, the governor has been just absolutely, um, you know, right on point and at calling in all of the uh, medical people and asking for new hospitals to be built. He's taking it very, very seriously. And so uh, Governor Cuomo estimates that up to 80% of the state's more than 19.4 million residents will get the coronavirus. But look at this case count here, 20,875 that's known And that places it um, above France as an entire nation, above South Korea. South Korea, uh, what, 18, 19 million people live there? New York City, 8 million people. So it's just astonishing uh, that uh, New York City has has exploded like this. But look at this. 13% of all cases have been hospitalized. 621 of the patients have ended up in the ICU. 157 people have died. 13% of all cases hospitalized. So that's running in there right in the breadbasket of the numbers that we posted, gosh, way back in January, um, pulling from Chinese data that suggested 15% of all cases uh, would have to be hospitalized. So, uh, you know, this is uh, not surprising. And there's, it's just confirming everything we thought about this. This is a very bad disease. And it hits old people, it hits young people, it hits all kinds of people. And uh, New York is now up to 16,000 people a day. That explains why they're vaulting up here. Other states aren't quite there yet. When they start doing this, they'll find out they've got more as well. Um, I think New York's just a little ahead of the curve on that. Spain, though, this is just really horrifying what's happening here. Uh, Plus 4,000 cases, 2,200 dead at this point in time. And still 2,300 in serious critical compared to 3,300 total recovered. So... Spain is a little bit earlier in the disease progression than Italy. The only way that we've seen so far to get your numbers down as a nation is to go into something that approximates the hammer from the hammer and dance we talked about yesterday. You have to go into complete lockdown. And of course, um, you have to communicate that well early, often transparently, all sorts of things, particularly if you got a nation of people who are slow adjusters or um, to use a different term, people who just don't get it or being, frankly, idiotic about this whole thing and going out into public, aggregating, not taking this all seriously, uh, standing too close to each other, all of that stuff. You know, that's where the official pronouncements really come in really handy and necessary. Germany, this is just something not right there. And of course, a number of you have sent me articles to suggest that this is a severe undercount, that it's at least 400 uh, belongs over in this column, but there's not a chance that this number isn't a lot, lot higher. So it turns out Germany as well might be a recording issue, uh, might not be uh, reported. Uh, There's a variety of things. Either that or there's some clear genetic uh, difference here going on in this population because otherwise this number doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Uh, I think it's more of a reporting issue at this point. 
And as we continue to look down, um, South Korea, you know, still has cases, but oh my gosh, that is a manageable case count. Switzerland, oh, that's an unmanageable case count. And Switzerland, by the way, is now the leader on this board of cases per 1 million population, approaching that 0.1%, uh, vaulted above Italy here. So spreading very, very well through Switzerland. And uh, the UK coming on strong here as well, uh, but still a long way to go uh, in the total cases per 1 million. I think that's a testing error as well. And we're starting to hear more and more dire stories out of UK, particularly South London, where uh, doctors and nurses are getting mugged for their badges, um, you know, on the way out of the hospital, that there's that there's more muggings and things like that going on. So social control is an issue that seems to be fraying in a number of countries. And I've heard some of the same out of New York City so far, too. But um, I can't confirm all of that quite yet. Quite yet. So we'll keep on with that. Um, what else is notable here? Not That's notable. Not as many cases as I was worried about coming out of Brazil. But is that a testing issue? We don't know at this point in time. Noting Malaysia had uh, a really big explosion that came from one big, uh, very unfortunate gathering that was held, but it seems to have really been spreading now. So again, maybe it's not spreading as as quickly in these southern slash, we'll call them summer climate countries, but uh, as well as it is up in these uh, more northerly countries, but it is spreading. So the whole idea of a, of a summer pause is inaccurate at this point in time. We can put a put a stake through that one. We can tell you that it might slow down, but that's the best we can hope for at this point. So, uh, yeah, the cases are still exponential. Here's the line coming through this. We've now crossed a quarter million cases outside of China. So that's uh, still, you know, we're totally on track here with about a 14-day tenfold increase. So we'll be uh, looking for our millionth case right out about here, uh, about another week or so. All right. Looking at India, I was asked to take a quick peek at India. And uh, so I did. And India has now uh, put millions of people under lockdown as the major, several major cities decided to run an experiment and see how well they could do this. I highly support experiments like this. This just came out from that article here. We find out that uh, residents living in 75 districts across the country, including major cities such as the capital, New Delhi, Mumbai, Bangalore, Chennai, Hyderabad, uh, Kolkata have been placed under travel, work, and movement restrictions until March 31st. So that's a week out from now. And only 415 cases identified so far, but already going into this full lockdown and, uh, and just seven deaths here. You would think that's early, but I, early is what you have to do here. You've got to catch this as early as possible. Waiting a couple of days even or even a day can make all the difference between being way behind this particular virus and slightly out in front of it. So a sudden rise in cases led to growing concerns of the country's capacity to test for the virus. Always a concern. And that a major outbreak on the scale seen in Europe, the pandemic's new epicenter, will spread in the country. Uh, this would be very concerning because it's a very densely populated country, of course, with uh, a lot of people do not have access to uh, wonderful, great uh, medical services, which, gosh, honestly, it can overwhelm even the best of medical services. So uh, always a concern wherever it shows up. And uh, I like this part. The decision to lock down parts of the country comes after India launched the world's biggest exercise in social distancing on Sunday. With the nation's 1.3 billion people asked to observe a self-imposed quarantine for 14 hours. You're thinking, 14 hours? What's that going to do? But it gets the ball rolling. It gets people used to the idea that you're going to uh, set the expectation that there is going to be um, a uh, quarantine and social distancing and all kinds of things like that coming. So that is a uh, a good experiment to run. It, it's, it be, I think it sets the stage. So that's great. Um as well, uh, we're seeing other moves like this, which we're seeing in a lot of other countries, which is, you know, it's probably best not to have inmates if you have to just tend for them. So Tihar jailed to release 3,000 inmates on parole, interim bail. Um, and so 1,500 convicts will be released on parole, another 1,500 uh, under trial prisoners to be released on interim bail. So they're releasing prisoners. I got that. And as well, we're seeing uh, curfews imposed and uh, that would include things like all shops and offices, except for those involved in essential services, will remain closed during this period. And uh, so we're seeing all of the same things coming up in India. India is just a little bit behind where some of the other countries are that we've been reporting about. 
Now, one of the things that's been driving me nuts, of course, we get uh, a lot of people still trying to minimize this saying, you know, it's the flu is worse. I still see that. And it's just, oh my God, those people are such slow adjusters. A uh, little bit annoying at this point in time because, I mean, come on, you can be slow, but that slow. And as well, uh, you know, we see a lot of people minimizing this by saying, oh, you know, it, it, it just hits the old people or it, you have to have an underlying condition, uh, something like that. But that's just not the case. So in this particular example here from yesterday, uh, this is an Olympic swimmer, right? Describes battle with coronavirus, the worst I've ever endured. Uh, and so um, this is retired South African swimmer Cameron van der Berg. Just 31. He's been struggling with the disease for the last 14 days and uh, says it's by far the worst virus I have ever endured despite being a healthy individual with strong lungs, no smoking, uh, of course, uh, living a healthy lifestyle and being young in the least at risk demographic. Although his worst symptoms like fever, severe fever have eased, Vandenberg said he's still grappling with serious fatigue and an unshakable cough. Any physical activity like walking leaves me exhausted for hours. So think about that. And I'm getting lots and lots of uh, stories like this. There's a a 12-year-old girl uh, that was just reported today who's in uh, ICU. There are younger people who, if this thing hits you, if it does hit you, it it can hit you really hard. And uh, even when this, this, by the way, would be described as a mild case. This is not a severe case. So for the, remember, severe means you went to the hospital. For Vandenberg here, he had what is still being termed a mild case, but it was by far the worst virus he's ever endured. And this formerly super physically, uh, you know, you know, very very robust individual now finds that walking leaves him exhausted for hours. Um, rich, famous, HB nineteen don't care. So this is the Rich and Famous edition, but I I put these up not because it's more important that rich and famous people get it, but I think that once they do, then you have uh, much uh, greater chances of seeing quick action on these sorts of things. So Senator Klobuchar says her husband has coronavirus. We just got the test results at 7 this morning. He now has pneumonia and is on oxygen, but not a ventilator. Uh, Ukrainian MP claimed there is no coronavirus in his speech. And later tested positive for COVID-19. So, um, you know, this virus uh, certainly has a, a strong t- sense of irony, at least. How about this? The Queen's Royal Aid tests positive for coronavirus. So, um, uh, obviously, the Queen would be in a poor demographic to receive this thing. Secret Service employee test positive for COVID-19. How many people were, uh, was this person serving in details uh, surrounding other uh, famous people? Placido Domingo has tested positive. Um Christopher Hivju from Game of Thrones, the actor Daniel Day Kim, a lot that's just piling up. So people are getting this all over the place. This doesn't know any socioeconomic boundaries. Um, This isn't something that you get because of a lifestyle choice or anything like that. It's just very, very easily communicable disease, and it's spreading all over the place. All right. Uh, I'm going to suggest that you do avoid ibuprofen for now. I was a little up in the air about it before, but um, I've been reading more stuff. And this is the only stuff I could find in, in mainstream news but um, that so I could sort of support this. But I've been getting lots of private messages from people and medical professionals. Anyway, I'm going to say avoid it for now. And the theory behind it is this, uh, is taking anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen or cortisone could be an aggravating factor of the infection Um, So if you have a fever, you're going to take uh, Tylenol, paracetamol, Um, if you need to. I mean, at this point, I might just say, why even knock the fever down unless it's really, really high? You know, don't turn to the pills right away uh, because we don't know what's going on with this particular virus yet. But it seems that if you're taking one of these non-steroidal anti-inflammatories or even a steroidal anti-inflammatory, somehow... That can be an aggravating factor, uh, and there is some data coming out to begin to support that, but I don't have enough good data to really share that here yet. But at any rate, under the precaution principle, until we know better, uh, just avoid it for now, okay? That would be my advice here at this stage. Uh, Everyone needs to wear a mask. Uh, I like how uh, R. Calhoun Sinroll put it here. I think wearing a mask should be the social equivalent to pants at this point. If I see you out in public without one, you're getting the evil eye. Uh, That's it. I I totally agree with that. You know, it's like I agree with this. Drunk driving and not wearing a mask in public. Same thing because you're um, out there 
your actions are potentially putting other people at risk, even deadly risk. So don't do it. Everybody should have a mask out in public. We shouldn't be seeing things like this anymore. But of course, this is still the rule, not the exception across a lot of countries out there. And just to point out some of the uh, pushback that comes out, uh, here's Jimmy uh, Savaria saying, hello, Chris, I've watched your YouTube channel for many years. I think you're very smart. However, this time, maybe perhaps you're being you're a little bit panicky because I'm saying that everybody should wear a mask. Nope, uh, Jimmy, it's not panicky. What it is is just basic science. So here's the deal. We know that this virus transmits through droplets that are expelled from people's mouths. That's part one. That's just, that's data. Okay, part two is uh, people can do that even when they are not sick. They, they don't know they're sick. It's called asymptomatic, meaning they don't have symptoms. And so you could have it, I could have it, not have symptoms, but still be spreading this. Out of, our, out of our mouths, right? The only way that you stop asymptomatic spreading, which is an important component of stopping this thing, is that everybody wears a mask. Everybody who's out in public. That way, I don't have to guess. I don't have to try and judge. Does that person look feverish? I don't have to wonder. You don't have to wonder. Nobody has to wonder. We can all get on with our lives in a much more normal fashion once we have everybody wearing a face mask. The data behind that, of course, is also comes from Hong Kong, where that's what everybody does. And they have a very rigorous program of decontaminating public surfaces. And guess what? They not only put the kibosh on new um, honey badger cases, they put the kibosh on seasonal flu and influenza A and B, all that stuff, right? So it works. It's not a little bit panicky. It's called logic and being reasonable and rational. All right. Um, all right. Let, let me let me skip. Let me put it this way. I like this title better. Yeah. Oh, really? So Kudlow uh, from the Trump administration, uh, you know, from National Economic Council director says, I don't think anyone could have predicted or expected this coronavirus spread. Oh, my God. You know, you don't just get to make up your own reality when it comes to something like this. The honey badger virus doesn't care about your reality or how you want to spin things. It doesn't really care about focus groups. It doesn't care what party you belong to. None of that matters. Come on, Larry. Don't think anyone could have predicted or expected. Yes, lots of people not only could, but did. And, uh, you know, I was among them, but there were a lot of others too. So, so what you could say instead is none of us here in the administration chose to listen to the people who did predict or expect this coronavirus spread. That's different, but that would be taking responsibility. That would be called having integrity. That would mean that you would understand that uh, you had failed to listen to the right people in this particular instance, and you should be learning from that and asking why that happened, not saying, I don't think anybody could have predicted or expected this coronavirus spread. That's eh, that's, a, that's not a good statement, which brings us back to the uh, title I put on this thing. Very little is needed for everything to be upset and ruined. Only a slight lapse in reason. Well, this is not a slight lapse. This is a major lapse in reasoning uh, right here, right out in public. Very embarrassing. All right. Let's talk about doing it right, though. Let's balance that out. This is doing it right. Uh, Akron, Ohio edition. Look at this. People waiting in line here to get in the store. Correct distancing. That's good. That's awesome. Nice, nice, nice. Look at this. Everybody spread out. This person even has a mask in public. Gloves, too. So we are getting there. This is uh, this is what this needs to look like. That is doing it right. And um, that's not panicky. That's just using basic uh, logic and sound hygiene principles. So why do I keep doing this? Uh, because I, I, I keep getting uh, missives like this. This just came in uh, to my inbox this morning. I get a lot of them. Um, this one came from New Zealand. I like this because um, this person uh, from New Zealand had noted that they made the decision to close their restaurant two days before New Zealand officially went to a level four on uh, their health emergency scale. And so this person was proactive and did what they needed to do. Why? Because they said, dear friends, I temporarily closed my in-house food and beverage service yesterday for the well-being of my customers, staff, family, and community because I don't want them to get sick. I want to protect our beloved seniors and those with pre-existing conditions in our community, including my mom, who spent her 82nd birthday alone to prevent risk to her. I did this for our medical professionals and emergency response teams to reduce the burden in the weeks to come. Yeah, 
That's exact. That's it. That's the whole thing right there. That's why we do this. This is logical. It's rational. And I'm sure it was a very difficult decision to make, but it was made. And that's the kind of heroes we need in this story. I could no longer, with a clear conscience, provide a gathering space that invites and encourages people to come together. By doing this, I am contributing to making the situation worse, as the biggest concern for me is that the virus is spreading unnoticed. For my small bar, I wish that precautionary measures worked, like hand sanitizer, spacing tables, and implementing a register of guest details. They just don't. Will we then be tasked with starting to assess people for signs of illness? I had to start to do that anyway. With alcohol flowing, there's reduced control over social distancing and increased interaction between people. It's unrealistic for these measures to work and very hard for staff to manage. In the near future, it is likely all our bars and restaurants will be forced to close as we follow suit with other countries. We should have done something sooner. This is the message we're hearing from around the globe. It's time to take this as seriously as we can. I encourage those in the industry to do the same. Love, Annie. Well done, Annie. And pulled the trigger before the country officially went down that route. And New Zealand, of course, going down that route earlier than other countries. Uh, a very proactive um, prime minister there. Just just doing a great job. So congratulations on that. And this is what keeps me going. And Annie had written me earlier to say thank you for all, all your work. She's up the curve, uh, understood what this virus is about, was able to assess it, and then take these sorts of actions. So this is what we're after information without action is useless in my world. So I love sharing this information if it leads to better outcomes like this. All right, let's talk about the disease progression really quickly. A lot of questions about this have come up. Um, first, you get exposed. Somehow you get exposed. Hopefully, remember, you want to get a, a light viral load, not a heavy viral load. With a light viral load, you have a better disease outcome and progression um, because What's going to happen is you're going to have more time as that light load of viruses has to replicate, replicate, replicate to become a heavy load in your body so that you, when, when you finally present to symptoms, it might have, it'll be more days. More days will have passed. And with that time, your body now has a chance to identify the invader, begin to mount its own response, you know, turn on the antibody machinery and all that, right? With a heavy load, it's much more likely that you're going to uh, present a, as a serious case. All right, so you get exposed, and then it's up to 14 days, maybe 27. We don't really know, but everybody's using 14 here. Um, I'm sure that e even if it was a 27-day, uh, I'm going to bet that the uh, it looks something like this with, um, with 14 days being about here, five to seven days being here in the center of this thing. Very few people will get it in one day, which would be way down here. But maybe a few, just, to, you know, out of out of a thousand people, there might be five or ten um, that, that exist down here, including at least one case out of China all the way out here to 27 days. But for the most part, 14 days, you're probably catching most of the area under that curve. So you're exposed 14 days and then when you finally become symptomatic, they're calling this day one. Patients run a fever. They may also experience fatigue, muscle pain, and a dry cough. A small minority may have had diarrhea or nausea one or two days before. And by the way, some of the early data I'm seeing suggests that if you do have the gastrointestinal uh, sign, that also uh, correlates with a more severe disease progression. Um, and so uh, I'm going to, you know, again, early data. I'm not, I've just seen the early reports around that. I haven't seen uh, really solid stuff. So just hold that as provisional for now. But um, again, uh, that would be a, a, a concerning sign, I think, if, if that comes up. Uh, enough to warrant additional attention. By day five, patients may have difficulty breathing, especially if they are older or have a pre-existing health condition. So uh, yeah, you just sort of, you feel bad, you feel bad. Then day five, you have that difficulty breathing. Day seven, now this is how long it takes on average before patients are admitted to a hospital. The Wuhan University study found, they're talking about that big study of 44,000 uh, patients. That was a big one. Um, so it uh, gave us a lot of good data. So this is kind of, at day seven, it's kind of like either you're going to be um, turning the corner for the better, or this is where it kind of takes a turn for the worse. And the problem is, it seems to take a really rapid turn for the worse. Like people are okay, people are okay. Well, they have a light case of pneumonia, bang, you know, 12 to 24 hours later, there's a serious um, ARDS uh, situation going on. So day eight, at this point, patients with severe cases develop ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, an illness that occurs when fluid builds up in the lungs. ARDS is often 
fatal. It's a, if untreated, it's very close to always fatal. It's a very bad thing. Day 10, if patients have worsening symptoms, this is the time in the disease's progression when they're most likely to be admitted to the ICU. These patients probably have more abdominal pain and appetite loss than patients with milder cases. Only a small fraction die. The fatality rate is hovered around 3%. Uh, to me, that's not a small fraction. 3% is uh, an unacceptable sort of a, a risk, uh, it, but that's me. Day 17, on average, people who recover from the virus are discharged from the hospital after two and a half weeks. So this is a really expensive uh, uh, disease in terms of, of money, obviously, but time and resources and attention. Uh, it takes a lot to keep these people um, alive and going from a medical standpoint. So that just wears the staff down, of course, to be on like that all the time. Um, as well, there's, uh, there's you know, a number of uh, stories out there now about a, a loss of sense of smell. Um, and so this comes from 22nd of March uh, and says here, anyone experiencing a sudden loss of smell could be a hidden carrier of the coronavirus, even if they have no other symptoms, according to evidence compiled by leading rhinologists in the UK. Um, so some people are apparently showing up going, I just completely lost my sense of smell. And uh, they're testing uh, very often now as being positive for coronavirus as well. You don't have to be asymptomatic. I, I don't like this the way this is phrased uh, here because there are people who are known to be symptomatic who are also uh, reporting this same uh, loss of sense of smell. So it's not everybody in South Korea, China, and Italy, about a third of patients who have tested positive for COVID-19 have also reported a loss of smell. All right. Um, yeah. So anyway, if you have a sense of loss of smell, that might be part of it. Remember, uh, you know, I said uh, I really I want you to consider planting a garden. I know not everybody can do that, but for those of you who can, and even if you're renting, uh, if there's a lawn out there, ask your landlord if you can, uh, you know, do this because every uh, – all right, I'm just going to um, straight up – I'm a little worried about what I'm seeing in terms of the food supply going forward simply because the movement of people, the movement of trucks – the movement of migrant labor, all of these things that are really, uh, we have a system of agriculture that's highly dependent on a certain set of processes. Most of those seem to be disrupted at this point in time. And not only is it healthy to be outside uh, working in a garden, not only is it enjoyable to be connected to your food and the process of growing things, uh, but it, it may be your best source of fresh and even untainted uh, vegetables uh, going forward. So I'm going to just reiterate this one. If you can, do it. If you can't, find somebody you can join forces with. Community gardens, uh, you know, nearby plots. Uh, see if you can work something like that out. And I'm going to also implore you to use this time wisely. Uh, do whatever you can to, you know, take this time you've got to really improve yourself, work on yourself, develop new skills, um, you know, create uh, order out of chaos. If you happen to have any chaos in your life, do things like that. And as well, all these endorsed personal actions really are things that we uh, just stand by here. So if you, hopefully you've already prepared your household, you know, you've bought the food, uh, masks if you can, that this is a, um, obviously an old list because, uh, that's gone for now, but Hey, masks will be coming back. We're hearing stories about, um, manufacturers that are retooling and, uh, yeah, fabric and textile manufacturer down in North Carolina said they're, they're going to try and Band up with other manufacturers to crank out 10 million masks a week. That would just be, you know, fantastic. All right. Um, stay home. Always wear a mask in public. Always. So I, I put this one back up because I added this one. This is new because I, I didn't have it on before, but it's got to be there. And if you are sick, don't go out. Just don't. And if you do have to go out because you have to go to shopping doctor something, something, you got to wear a mask. But don't be going to work sick. Don't do that. Practice your excellent personal hygiene. Make your home a green zone, right? Don't let anybody inside you're, you aren't 100% sure um, is, is clean, all right? And um, whoops. help others uh, in your neighborhood and community. I'm, I'm doing a lot in that regard in my own local community here as much as I can. And make sure that you get good rest, take vitamins, do things to really keep your immune system up because uh, that could be a huge deal. Uh, if you get a light load of virus, maybe it doesn't even catch hold on you because you're that healthy. Here's the call to action. We need to make masks. A lot of people, you, those of you out there who uh, know how to sew, there's patterns all over the place out there. Here, let me jump over to my, yeah, look at this. I just typed in do-it-yourself mask pattern into Google and uh, Forbes put a thing out calling on all people who can sew and make. 
Uh, we need people to make masks. Um, here are these people who've made them, distributing them to medical providers. And if you just go to, there's videos. I mean, this is a whole giant, like, victory garden cottage industry thing going on right now. There's free patterns everywhere. There's lots of ideas. So if you have any sort of uh, skills like this, or even if you don't, maybe it's time to learn a new one. The call to action here is it's time for us to make these face masks until we can um, get our manufacturing back up. We really, really need these. And anything is better than nothing in this story, even if it's just a couple of layers of cotton. And that's only 50% effective. Remember, if that blocks you from having a 100% of a viral load and cuts it down to a 50% viral load, that helps. So it's better than nothing. And unfortunately, we got a whole lot of nothing going on out there. All right. Conclusions for today. First, if your leaders flail about, the consequences grow exponentially. Time matters. Just like that example of where Annie shut her restaurant down in advance of being told to do that, that was the right thing to do. Countries that can step forward uh, and in the United States, states and governors who can step forward and take action before every other governor has done it. You know, there's the, the leaders in this are going to be the ones who are willing to take those actions early because you can look at the story and you can say there's nothing special about Rhode Island or Texas or, you know, a certain province in France as compared to what's happening in Lombardy, Italy, right? All that's different between you and that place is time. And so if you can get out in front of that, all the better. This coronavirus, it hits hard. It's a really nasty bug. It is not an old person's disease. It is not the flu. Um, it is not something that people are being unnecessarily panicky about. It's a bad, bad disease that, that can come through. Um, and if it overwhelms your hospital system, can really take out big percentages of uh, your population. Now, I consider big to be numbers like 5, 6, 7%. To me, those are huge. And if we can avoid that, let's do it. Well, life has now changed forever. It really is. And uh, what was is really not coming back. So for those of you who don't know, Adam Taggart and I wrote this book, Prosper, a few years back. It works. Uh, it walks through eight different forms of capital that you can build up. And in there, we really talk about how um, – and those eight forms of capital, financial capital, we're all familiar with that. But we also include things like social capital. If you have that, that's going to be a really important determinant to your success in this next period of time and your happiness and your fulfillment – uh, in, in life, in your sense of meaning and purpose, emotional capital, really important in this story. And so things like that, we talk through all of those. But the key thing I wanted to talk about in Prosper um, and, and why I'm, I'm referencing this book right now, and we talk about how life has now changed forever and what was is not coming back. One of the key things that we talk about under financial capital is the, is the necessity of having multiple streams of income, of being entrepreneurial, of figuring out quickly, more quickly than the average bear, um, how the landscape has changed and how you can add value into that new landscape. Because there will always be an economy. Even if your job went away and you lost your paycheck, you have value. And there are things that people need that you can do. And those who are going to do and do the best and fare the best are going to be those who make that adjustment quickest. And so we talk about that whole process in here, and I just wanted to raise that now uh, because it's it's really more relevant than ever. You're on your own. We're all on our own at this point. Um, it's just taken the authorities too long to rally around this and, and, and get their stuff together. And uh, each of us needs to be responsible for ourselves in this story. So I've had people say, you know, there are no face masks to buy. The, you know, what do you want me to do? I want you to figure out how to make them. You know, and I don't want you to uh, ask me to to find them for you and send you a pattern and then tell you where to get the materials and then show you how to sew. I want I want people. This is arming you, arming everyone with information that says, time to get creative. This you're on your own. This isn't this. You could you could take this as sort of a, uh, I don't know. That could sound like a somewhat depressing statement, but it's not. This is also an invitation to say, you know, you're you're out in the wilderness. Now is the time you got you to make the most of it. So we need everybody to be um, proactive, clever, creative, all of that stuff. I love seeing the people in Akron are lining up with appropriate social distancing. If you live in an area where that's not yet happening, you got to be the person who's out there leading by example. And because as soon as enough people 
lead by example. Next thing you know, it's, it's, uh, it's everywhere. Finally, man, this is going to be rough. And uh, it didn't have to be this way. It really didn't. Sorry, Larry Kudlow. We could have seen this coming. We should have seen this coming. There were experts who were even far more well-positioned than I was who could have been saying this weeks before I even cottoned on to it. And you should have been listening to them. And if you did, it wouldn't have been this way. Uh, But here we are. We're going to make the most of it. My invitation to you is take up this call to action. Figure out how to make masks and distribute them to the people who need them and pitch in like that. All right, everybody. That's all for today. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Hi, folks. Adam Taggart here. Chris Martinson and I are the co-founders of Peak Prosperity. If you want to get alerted whenever we release a new video from Chris, just click the red subscribe button right beneath the YouTube video player. Once you've done that, a little bell icon will appear right next to it. Click on that bell. It looks like this. And that's it. The next time we publish a video from Chris, you'll immediately receive a notification from YouTube. Thanks for watching our videos.